a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview. Hello and welcome to the 100th episode. That's right, the 100th episode of Curiosityness. I am Travis DeRose, the host of the 100th episode of Curiosityness. I just can't keep saying it. We're in triple digits now. It's crazy. Uh, 100 episodes. I just feel pretty pretty thankful, pretty excited that uh, you know this happened. It took about two years to get 100 episodes, but damn, it's been great. So I want to I wanna talk about you know, how thankful and lucky and happy I am to do 100 episodes, but I'm not going to do it now. I'll do it at the end of the episode. So you can you can listen to this episode because this is a good one. But if you want to stick around at the end of the episode, you can hear me, you know, schmooze a little bit about having 100 episodes of curiosityness and talking about that. But this episode you're going to like. I have on Terry Verts, and Terry Verts is an astronaut. That's right. I have an actual astronaut on the show. And, uh, Good God, it was so fun to talk to him. He he's just like such an awesome guy. So much fun stuff to share. He has a an IMAX movie. He's got a bunch of movies and books, but his his IMAX movie, A Beautiful Planet. Um, he just came out with a book called How to Astronaut. So we talk about all that kind of stuff, you know. And we dive into how he got into being an astronaut, how to become an astronaut, what the training's like, what it feels like to actually launch into space and have you know like. A bunch of rockets underneath you and, and feel that and what it's like to look at earth from space and the stars and the dangers of space and close calls that he, where he almost died and yeah it's, it's a crazy episode it's it's you know who doesn't love talking to an astronaut so pretty excited about this episode let's get to it stick around for the hundredth curiosity spiel at the end but uh without further ado here is terry verts in episode 100 Terry, hello. We're going. How you doing, man? Hey, how's it going? Good. Doing well. Cool. Thanks for being here. I mean, seriously, awesome. Stoked to talk to you. I can't. I've, I've been pretty excited for this conversation. Um, I mean, I, I'm always. I love doing these interviews, and I always. I'm always telling my friends and family about uh, who I'm interviewing, and that you know they're kind of getting over it. But once I said I was interviewing an astronaut, now they <laughs> then they perked up a little bit. You know, they like that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the podcast thing is, is good, man. That's what people listen to these days. That's it's what I cool. listen to. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I started off as just a fan. I'm like, hey, I got to start one of these things and, and talk to some people like you. Yeah, I got a, a guy called me today to see if I want to, he wants to produce my podcast. So um, it's something I've thought about doing my own, but I haven't, haven't taken that leap yet, but we'll see. Okay, so you might have one coming up? We'll see. Okay. It's a lot you of have- work, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, any, what are you thinking of the, like topic wise, kind of an interview thing? Or are you going to be, I would just do an interview. I, I have so many different interests and, you know, I, I would not narrow it down at all. I would just keep it open. And I know people from all around the universe, so to speak. So, right. um, I think if I did it, it would have to be very open-ended, just like a conversation with cool people or something like that. Mm -hmm. it's the best man it's like i would never have thought that people would want to listen to just a long ass conversation but i love listening to it myself so Uh, it's crazy i'm gonna be i'm gonna go on joe rogan next week so i've been listening to some of his and he'll do like three and four hours or longer sometimes it's crazy he does crazy stuff but they're great it's great yeah Yeah. it's really good i love it yeah he was one of the reasons why i started doing this myself so well that's cool that you're going on there congrats man you're blowing up here it's very fun it'll be cool it'll be good um, well, I mean, let's just get into it. I mean, we got to start with the, uh, you know, how did you become an astronaut? Cause that seems like everybody's, everybody wants to do it. It seems like I, you know, I every kid thought wants to about it. Yeah. Yeah. But you actually made it happen. Every kid wants to. So, um, the first book I ever read was about Apollo. I was in kindergarten. I read one of those cardboard books and I was just captured, you know, from the earliest days I grew up with pictures of airplanes and rockets, um, you know, a really important moment. I went to the National Air and Space Museum there in the mall in D.C. because mm-hmm. uh, I grew up in Maryland, and um, I saw an IMAX movie called To Fly, and it was like the coolest movie of all time. It's still one of the best IMAX movies. It, ma- it was one of the first IMAX movies. I was just a little kid, um, but it was just so awesome. 
I felt like I was flying and, you know, that's what I wanted to do. Ironically, I've, I got to make an IMAX movie on my last space flight called A yes. Beautiful Planet. I helped make it, you know, one of many. Um, but that kind of touched off my love of directing and film. And so I'm, that's kind of the universe I've moved into. Um, but that was uh, kind of an important moment for me seeing that. And then in high school, I read a book called The Right Stuff. And which was made into an amazing movie. Um, in fact, one of the guys that helped me film my most recent film, I just directed my first film, One More Orbit. And one of the cinematographers on there was actually a camera operator on the right stuff. So he, he helped film the right stuff. Nice. But that showed me how like the early astronauts became astronauts and it, it kind of showed me the path forward. So those were those were a couple of really important stepping stones along this path, this journey that I took to be an astronaut. Right. Yeah, totally. And I, I looked at, I haven't seen the, the, uh, your film, the IMAX film, but I saw, I looked up the trailer for it. Looks incredible. Looks so awesome. I, I really have got to watch it now. It, it's amazing. I mean, I was just one, many people helped film that movie. I was just one, but, um, uh, Tony Myers was my director. She directed all the IMAX space movies going back to the eighties and she got her start in the seventies and she was incredible. She was my mentor. Um, I dedicated one more orbit to her, you know, cause she, unfortunately she passed away last year from cancer. Hmm. And so she was, she was amazing. She kind of taught me how to direct. And, uh, I think she, she saved her best for last. Um, it hmm. was the first IMAX film in space that was done with digital cameras and so all the early IMAX, every IMAX film you've probably ever seen was filmed with these giant 70 millimeter, you know, big ass film cartridges. Sure. And the, this big 50 or 100 pound cartridge would have three minutes of film. So each 30 second scene, there was no rehearsing. There was one shot, one take only. Um, and you'd get, you know, six takes six shots in one cartridge for a space shuttle flight. So the early movies were kind of limited with digital. We could shoot a lot. We could shoot at night. So you'll see the mm -hmm. first ever Aurora in the, in a beautiful planet. You'll see the first yes. ever night lightning in a beautiful planet um, inside the space station uh, in the, in, in the Soyuz with a GoPro. And I think one of the most impressive things was a GoPro I took outside. It was a Russian GoPro. The Russians went to Best Buy, bought a GoPro. They built a box to keep it um, thermally stabilized and pressurized. Um, so they lent it to me. I borrowed it. I took it outside on my spacewalks and filmed some stuff. So anyway, the digital really opened up a whole world of possibilities in making IMAX movies. And one of the coolest things I do now in this new post NASA life that I have, um, I do guest lecturing at the USC Film School out in LA. And for their IMAX class, they teach an IMAX class once a year. So I've been out there the last three or four years teaching that class, which is a lot of fun. Nice. Very cool. And so when you said, yeah. you know, before, before digital, they're limited. Is it because like, I mean, these huge cartridges that you're just limited on how much space and weight you can bring up? Yeah. Volume, mass. Yeah. Um, also astronaut training. So I think Tony and Jim Nyhouse was our director of photography. He was also my director of photography on one more orbit. Um, he's another kind of old man of the sea. He's been around for decades. <laughs> um, he, you know, the world's one of the world's top IMAX experts for sure. Um, so, but he wasn't there shooting it. I was there shooting it and my mm -hmm. crewmates were there shooting it, you know? So, um, he always laughs about how he's the director of photography and he only had one scene in the whole film that he shot. Um, cause he has to trust us to do it. So you're limited in time, volume and weight, but you're also limited in that you don't have ASC members, you know, pulling the trigger on the camera. They're, they're astronauts. So, um, and you, you know, the shuttle is only so big. The space station is pretty big, but there's, there's only so much you can do with it. There's not a lot of lighting, the lighting, the lack of lighting rather is one of the biggest limitations that we have in filming space movies. Um, oh. uh, one of the shots in beautiful planet, I got a Samantha in the cupola with me moving in. We, we I just didn't have the lights to the earth is so bright during the day that it's impossible to get inside the space station and earth exposed together mm -hmm. at the same Spools time it out right it, it wants something is either blown out or too dark um, right and unless we we had to wait she was literally waiting until we went over this dark jungle so where it wasn't too bright she was counting down three two one and then i started filming while she pretended like she was doing something and you know it was a it was a tough scene to get and you, you won't even notice it if you watch the movie it's 
you know, 10 seconds in the movie. But for me, it was a big deal because I know it was it was a cool shot to film. Right. Yeah. You guys are becoming filmmakers up there. Well, and how cool that yeah. you get to do like a, that you get to now kind of film and, and make a IMAX movie, which is kind of what initially got you into all this stuff to start with. So now you're bringing more yeah. people into the fold, maybe. I think of all the stuff I did at NASA and 16 years as an astronaut filming that IMAX movie was the most important. Um, just so many people saw it. Uh, you know, millions of people are going to see that they're going to be inspired. And so that, the, the other stuff I did, I'm not saying it wasn't important, but sure. you know, the IMAX movie is going to be really uh, well done. And again, I was just one of many people who made the movie, but um, for me, I loved it, and I know it was, I know it was really important. Yeah. Well, give me the name of the movie again. A beautiful pa- planet, a beautiful okay. planet, and okay. it's narrated by Jennifer Lawrence um, oh. and us, of course. I narrate some, and Samantha narrates some, and other other crewmates narrate some. But uh, yeah, J- Jennifer is like the main narrator. Space Station 3D was 2002, and Tom Cruise narrated that one. Ooh. And then 2009, there was a Hubble one. Leo DiCaprio narrated Hubble. And then for the last one, Tony got Jennifer Lawrence, which was awesome. I mean, she's yeah. amazing. Um, All right. So yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Cool stuff, man. Um, okay, so let's jump back. How did you? So how did you actually turn this? You know, you're starting to you're you're a young young fella maybe, and you're you're starting to get interested in space. You see the IMAX movie. How do you then turn that into your career and make it happen? Um, a lot of luck, <laughs> but you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So w- what I figured out was like what path to take. And so you can't just say, I want to be a doctor and be like, there's a special path you have to take. You need to get an undergrad degree and you need to do really well and you need to prepare for the MCAT test. And then you need to get ready to interview and interview for med school. And then, you know, it's a years and years of, of, of getting through there. If you want to start a company, that's great. But like, you have to learn the business first. You have sure. to come up with a product, you have to raise money. So my point is whatever you want to do in life, you have to kind of figure out the path. And for me, the path to being an astronaut was through being a pilot. So I, I went to the air force Academy um, became an F-16 pilot and then a test pilot and then an astronaut. So that was kind of the path I took. Others can be engineers or medical doctors or scientists. There's other ways to get to be an astronaut, but at NASA, probably a, it used to be close to half. Now it's probably a third are actual pilots. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. I wanted to be a, a pro skateboarder when I was a kid cause I was playing Tony Hawk on PlayStation, but I couldn't, right. couldn't even stand on a skateboard. So it wasn't really going to happen. <laughs> I wanted to be a baseball player, but I couldn't, I couldn't hit a curveball, and I, and I couldn't really hit a fastball either. And I had a, I had a, and my arm was pretty weak, but I, and I didn't have a good glove. So other than that, and I'm really slow. So besides that of the five tools, you know, so yeah, I had to, had to go for my second choice. Plus there was this guy named Cal Ripken. I grew up in Baltimore. So unfortunately Cal was there playing shortstop for the Royals. So right. <laughs> for, for, for 2,600 games in a row or something like that. So I didn't have a shot. Right. Close though. You just, those few things you just had to, if it wasn't for those things, I yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's the thing. Everybody's like, just work hard. You can do whatever you want. You can dream, be whoever you want. You can dream. I mean, that's just not true. Like I can't be a major league baseball shortstop. I could not be a ballerina. If I wanted to be a ballet dancer, male ballet dancer. I, that's something I could not do. Um, I could not sing. I think I could play, I could be in a rock band, but I could not, you know, be the singer cause I can't sing. Sure. So there's some, like, everybody has gifts and talents and abilities. So, you know, especially for young folks, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do, um, you know, you have to be, there have to have a little bit of realism in there. Um, mm-hmm. but it's what you can do is probably a lot broader than what you think. Um, you know, I'm never going to win the Olympic hundred meter sprint. It doesn't matter how hard I work. I could work all day long. I'm not going to do that, but there's lots of other things I probably could do and have done. And so that's one of the things I tell people is don't tell yourself, no, don't take yourself out of the running. I can. So right now I'm an author. I'm in fact, I'm working on a book right now and I just signed a contract for my next book. So as soon as I'm done with this one this week, I'm going to start on the next one next week. It's a kid's book. It's a small book, but it'll be fun. But I can promise you in high school, I was the least likely to write a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kid's book is going to be my fifth book in the last three or four years. So yeah. um, 
it's something, you know, writing is something that you can just about in, as long as you have some basic ability, you could you can write. You can write mm-hmm. something. Um, you may not write the next great American novel, uh, but you could write a blog or, you know, you could do something. Um, so anyway, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, what is possible? Can you really do anything you dream of doing? Um, and the answer is probably yes, a lot more often than a lot of people give themselves credit for. Right. Yeah. But be realistic, too, a bit about it. So, Yeah. Be realistic. And by that, I mean, there's probably some things that you just can't do, but every, I think most people are realistic, you know, yeah. if they're, if they're not going to win the Olympic sprinting, they know that. Um, but you know, if you're kicking butt in school, if you're a good athlete, give it a shot. You know, a lot sure. of, I know I'm a baseball guy. Um, a lot of baseball kids, not a lot, but sometimes you get to college and you add five or 10 miles an hour to your fastball. Like, where did that come from? And then all of a sudden you're in the majors three years later. So, um, and sometimes you go to college throwing 90 and three years later, you're throwing 85 and you're done. Right. Is it, but who knows? And my, my point is, um, if you have that dream, don't tell yourself, no, don't take yourself out of the running. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to go for it. And if you're going to go for it, you got to figure out what the path is. It's not just going to happen and then work hard. And then if it doesn't happen, come up with a new strategy, try a different way, try a different thing. But, um, at least, you know, you tried and gave it a shot. Um, right. So. So was there anything that, um, you know, in regards to being an astronaut that you found you had, or maybe there is in far as like in regards to like characteristics or, or, you know, certain attributes in a person that you would look for, you know, if they're going to be an astronaut? So my last job at NASA was to sift through 18,000 applications. Um, It was kind of all hands on deck. A lot of the astronauts went through these 18,000 applications for the new astronaut class. And I I was helping. Um, And you need something to make you stand out. So, well, first of all, you need the minimums, right? So for NASA, that's a technical degree. You got to have an engineering or math or science degree or medical degree, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you need, if you're a pilot, you need a thousand hours of jet time. If you're you need a certain number of amount of experience. You know, there's some minimums. So of course you have to meet that. If you're going to be an astronaut, you have to have more than the minimum. So rather than just having a technical degree, you probably need a PhD. Mm-hmm. If you're not a pilot, I would go so far as to say you need a PhD if, if you're not a pilot. Um, uh, and there's other things that you do um, uh, to stand out. Like there was this one, I remember this one application, this lady had been a NASCAR um, mechanic, which is pretty cool. Like that stood out. Um, folks that are fighter pilots and test pilots that stands out. Uh, if you have serious mountain climbing experience or scuba underwater work, or, you know, NASA is looking for operational types of things. So people who are actually, um, not just book nerds, you know, not just writing on a chalkboard all day and writing equations on a, in their office, but actually doing something that kind of puts them at risk. Uh, flying was super important. But anyway, so having that good, strong foundation and then having something that makes you stand out. Things that weren't impressive were big names on the letters of recommendation. A lot of times people think, well, I'll get the whatever, the senator to write me a letter of recommendation. Well, you can tell if he knows you or doesn't. And nine times out of ten, they They don't know who you are. Right. Um, And that doesn't do you any good. Um, uh, So, you know, you can kind of sift through things that matter and things that don't matter. Um, But uh, people who do what they love tend to do better at stuff. Another thing for me, ironically, that really stood out as a warning was somebody who never failed and was always perfect at everything. I remember there's one application, a guy had a 5.0 GPA at MIT. MIT does it on a five scale. Oh, I guess okay. they're so smart. They're so smart there. They don't have fours. They, <laughs> sure. that, would, that would insult them. So, and he was like the number one at this, number one at that, top grad, perfect grades. And I knew astronauts who were like that. And they're super difficult to get along with. And you don't want to mm-hmm. be around them. And they're always right. And they're perfect. And so people who have never failed, um, were, that was a warning flag for me. Right. Yeah, I could see that. And then, so what is the, once you're kind of in there, what does the whole training process look like? What do they, what do they throw you through? <laughs> well, the basic ASCAN training, astronaut candidate, they, they really want to pump up your ego. <laughs> Ask. You're an, you're an ASCAN. Uh, it's about a year and a half long. So for me, it was learning the space shuttle and the space station. 
Um, now they just have to learn the space station um, mm. and they'll learn, they start learning Russian and they start learning space walk skills. Wow. Um, there's a little bit of public affairs training, a uh, little bit of science and payload training. Um, uh, so uh, there's flying jets is a super important part of being an astronaut. So the, the pilots are used to it, but the non-pilots are not. So they, they just have to get used to working as a crew and this dynamic, you're flying fast and you you might die. And, you know, that's <laughs> the kind of thing that you want to get used to before you go into space. Right. So, Jeez, man. So they're, they're lit- like people who have never flown before. They're teaching them to fly jets. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now they're not the front seaters. They're in the back seat. Oh, okay. um, they ride, they ride in the back seat, but they're still, you know, they talk on the radio, they do the navigation systems. They, they do fly sometimes we'll give them the jet and they'll fly for some amount of time and then they give it back. But the pilots do the takeoff and landing. Mm. Um, and sometimes, sometimes as pilots, I would fly solo. You just go fly by yourself. That's fine. Um, but, uh, the, the real purpose of the jet is to keep, we call it space light readiness training. Uh, it's doing something operational. Okay. And then, so what is, um, how does, I mean, I would, I would guess that that would kind of attribute to, or, you know, contribute to your mental training a bit too, but like, how does, what do they do for that kind of stuff? Is it just putting you under pressure yeah. for a, a lot and having to do tasks or what's the, what's the progress for that? It, 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 it's all about the mental thing. The flying training is, has nothing to do with the stick and rudder skills of how to land a T-38. And everything to do with staying calm under pressure, mm-hmm. you know, when you're running low on gas, when the weather's bad, it's nighttime, whatever, it, dealing with those pressure, real life situations where your butt's on the line. Like in a simulator, if you make a mistake, you hit pause and you get out and you go to lunch. But in a jet, you know, if you make a mistake, you might die. So those are things that um, astronauts really need to be able to handle. And also situational awareness or we call it staying ahead of the jet. So you have to be aware of what's happening and aware of what's going to happen in the near future. And that's called situational awareness. It's something that's important on earth when you're driving a car, what's going on around you. A lot of times kids, teenagers have no essay. There are no situational awareness. They're just like, uh," and you know, they don't know, they forget their phone. They don't know what's going on because their brains aren't developed yet. Then they're not, um, they're not ready for the real world um, as an adult. And I constantly have, it's this internal clock that's constantly going off as a fighter pilot. You need to get, you know, poked in the eye every couple seconds to watch what you're doing. Cause if you get distracted and I've almost killed myself several times, thankfully I had an automated system that prevented me from hitting the ground or I would have died. Um, wow. If you just get, if you get target fixated is what we call it in the fighter community where you're just staring at the target and while you fly into the ground, um, you you lose your situational awareness. And so the T-38 teaches you that like you, you need to have this internal clock that snaps you back to looking at your attitude, making sure that the top end of the jet is up and the bottom end is down. Um, what's in front of you, what's happening. And then you can go get distracted and you immediately have to come back and we call it a cross check, but that skill is good in a jet, but it's good in life in general. Like, yeah. Did I forget my keys? Where's the phone? What's my next meeting? Uh, did I get to that task? You know, adults have this, your brain is constantly running of these tasks that we have. And um, being able to sort that out, I think, is a big part of being an astronaut. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, just in for everyday life type of stuff, too, even like, how do you how do you develop that skill? Because it it kind of in my life, it seems like some people have it or some people don't have it. But is it something that you can develop? Do you just have to put yourself in those situations more often to get to get that? Well, so by the time you're an astronaut, um, you have gone through a lot of pre-screening, right? Like you've been successful in some technical profession. You're at the top of that technical profession. So you've gone through lots of checks along the way. Hopefully, you know, Mm -hmm. bosses don't put you in those positions without you performing well. That's true. So the kind of folk, the kind of folks that show up at NASA are generally pretty capable people, you know, whatever it is they're doing. Um, but then, you know, we do training. The T-38 is good training. Spacewalk training is, is really good for that kind of thing. Um, we actually had a time management. I forgot the name of the kind. This is like 15 or 20 years ago. They came. They did the planner. It was a really big consulting company like 20 years ago. I don't know, even know if they're still in business, but 
I remember the guy came and they did the demonstration of the big rocks and small rocks. Have you ever seen this or heard of this? No. It's a great way to manage your day. This one little illustration has stuck with me for my whole life. So if he gives you a jar and all these rocks, some are big, some are small or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, some people put all the little rocks in and then they'll try and put the big rock in at the end and it doesn't fit. But the key is you put the big rock in first and then the little rocks kind of fall in behind it. Mm. And the, 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 the illustration, the point is in your life, get the big things done first and then fill in the little things afterwards. Unfortunately, email and WhatsApp and text and stuff. It's so easy just to deal with the latest thing and not get to that really big thing that's waiting. And that thing is going to be painful. It's going to take you time. It's a couple day project, but if you get it done, you might get a new job or you'll make a lot of money or whatever. Right. Um, and the little things are meaningless, but they can take up all your time. And so the, that one little illustration was really useful for like how to manage your time, get the big stuff done first. And then the little stuff can, can follow as possible. Hey, I think they told us to divide all your tasks by three, a group, B group, C group. So every day you look at your schedule and just start doing the A. And when that's done, you start doing the B. And if you don't ever get the C's, you don't ever get to the C's. Oh, okay. doesn't even matter if you don't get to the C's. You can, you can sleep happy that night. You're not going to die if you didn't check the email from whoever. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so how, how many, how much time did you spend in space? I was there for, uh, over seven months. My first flight was about two weeks and my second flight was about 200 days. Wow. That is amazing. And so that's crazy. Um, so what does it feel like? I'm curious because you, because you actually piloted the, the shuttle, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was a shuttle pilot. Yeah. You were a shuttle pilot. So what is, mm-hmm. I'm just curious about kind of the whole launch process, you know, piloting the shuttle. Like what is, what is that like? What does it feel like? <laughs> well, it's unlike anything I've ever done. That's for sure. Um, the, the first thing that happened was four in the morning. And so nighttime turned into day because the engines were so bright. Oh, wow. And then they were also so loud. I've never heard a roar like I heard. And then when the engine's lit, you're thrown back um, and you're just smashed against your seat. It's very disorienting. There's this massive noise. All this fire just happened. You're smashed back and you're, all the gauges suddenly, you've been laying there for three hours, nothing. And all of a sudden everything comes to life and all the gauges are moving. And it, it, it's an amazing experience. And that's just the first couple seconds. And then that acceleration goes on for eight and a half minutes as you go from zero to 17,000 miles an hour. And then, (laughs) and then it all turns off and then you're floating, which is alien. Um, And then you're seeing the earth, which is the most beautiful thing. You can't even imagine how awesome it is. Um, And then your brain is going, what in the hell just happened? Cause you're, you know, you're dizzy and it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. So what's going through your mind during that, that three hours that you're just sitting there? You know, I was pretty mellow. I had a few tasks to do. As you get closer to launch, the pilot has some really critical tasks to do. If you do them wrong, it scrubs the launch or blows the shuttle up. So in the last <laughs> eight minutes, the APUs you can you can blow up the space shuttle. So you had to be you Jeez. had to be on your game for that. So for the most part, like I was sleeping or I was telling doctor jokes. I printed out some doctor jokes um, <laughs> because the doc the docs can listen on the intercom, but they can't talk to us. So we just you know, so you had no idea if they were laughing at them. I'm sure they were in my mind. They were so right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, man. Yeah. Cause I was watching that, you know, the recent, uh, the SpaceX guys who went up and there, I was watching it live and they're just sitting there forever. I'm like, geez, man, like, I feel like I, I would just have so much adrenaline, you know, waiting for this to happen. And then I think they had to call one off too, you know, after sitting there and everyone, everyone just, just leaves you getting as far away as possible. It just seems like an incredible, scary ass experience. Yeah. The, you know, the, the guy, they, they put you in, strap you down, shake your hand. You hear this thunk when they shut the hatch and they have this big, huge bolt on the space shuttle. And then they, uh, they get in their truck and drive as fast as they can five miles away. So (laughs) yeah. Get the hell out of there. Um, pretty smart. Yeah. (laughs) It's probably a good idea. So what's the, uh, you mentioned like seeing, 
you're seeing earth from space. What is, what is that like? What is, you know, does it change your perspective on life or anything? You know, how's that? Yeah. You know, so earth from space, um, it does. I, I saw it so much. My first book view from above was a Nat Geo photography book. Um, the book I just came out with kind of my big book is called how to astronaut. And, uh, it's, it's words. It's not photography. It's, I, I discussed this experience in there. Um, then of course a beautiful planet, I made a movie or I helped make a movie about that. So it's such an amazing experience. I want to share it with as many people as I can. And how to astronaut, I talk about just like you're in space and the, your planet is over there, you know, and you're not on it. And, um, it's pretty profound for me. Um, it, it was like, it was a big deal, you know, like I left earth. Um, yeah. then, you know, every, you can joke, Oh, he, he's left earth or whatever. Most people leave earth and don't come back, but, um, you know, and then we got to come back. So it, it gives you a perspective that I hope I'm less black and white. I, I'm less black and white than I was before I went up there uh, a little bit more mellow about stuff. Um, it's really hard to be impressed after you, spend you know hours or days or months looking at the planet it's really hard to be impressed when you come back home not to say i don't like stuff i love stuff i'm at this amazing i'm at my friend's house it's amazing i love a great meal you know i love there's so many things on earth that i love but um i, I guess things like celebrity don't impress me mm-hmm. or meaningless thing meaningless things don't impress me sure um so uh, I, I think that's for me anyway, not less black and white and probably harder to impress, I think. Mm-hmm. So you're, you get to go visit the the Grand Canyon and everyone's impressed and you're just like, <laughs> you guys haven't seen anything yet. The, the Grand Canyon is small. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, I didn't think that was it. I was looking around, where's the Grand Canyon? And it was like, <laughs> it's this little, it's this little thing. And I thought it was going to be this big thing. Like even the Himalayas, my crewmate was talking in this movie about Oh my God, they're so huge and impressive. And I remember thinking there it's this little band of mountains on the North side is this Chinese desert. And on the South side is the Indian jungle. And they're not that big. They're kind of long from West to East, but Mm -hmm. it goes from jungle to mountains to desert pretty quickly. Just like in South America, South America is a lot quicker over the Andes mountains from the Pacific to the Andes to the desert to the Amazon happens pretty quick, really quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so things don't seem as big or impressive, but other things do. So it just depends on your perspective changes. Yeah, for sure. Mm. It's more like the, uh, instead of the Grand Canyon, it's like the mediocre Canyon from up there. The, 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 the not too small Canyon. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I mean, just some of that, cause you can always see the, can you always see the, uh, Northern lights from up there? Are they always going on? No, no, no. Well, first of all, you can only see them in like December, January, February, it has to be dark. Okay. So in July, it's never dark. So you can't see them. Um, It doesn't mean they're not happening. You just can't see them. And they're only happening when the sun is active. So the sun has these giant explosions. They're called CMEs, coronal mass ejections. And it they shoots out like an earth mass of electrons, you know, some massive radiation event. And the, the sun has a super powerful magnetic field. So, the electrons will be going this way and the magnetic field will bend them around to the left and, um, and the earth's moving. So it takes about a day. It's not light. It only takes light, you know, nine minutes to get to the sun, but the electrons are going really fast, but it still takes about a day. And if the earth's magnetic field happens to intersect the sun's magnetic field, as these electrons are flying by, they get captured and then they get funneled down to the North magnetic pole and the South magnetic pole. And that's what causes the Northern lights or the Southern lights. Um, and if it's the right time of year and if your orbit is flying over there when it's nighttime and you're awake and you have time to be looking out the window. And so if all the planets align, then you can see the most amazing thing you've ever seen. I mean, it's beyond imagination. Man, yeah, I saw some of that footage. It just looks incredible. I would, yeah, I was blown it away. is, it is, it really is. Uh, a beautiful planet. Tony and the IMAX guys made an amazing compilation of a Southern Lights pass. Some of my crewmates shot, and it's really awesome. Wow. What about um, you know looking away from Earth, looking at you know yeah. the rest of space, stars? What's that like from up there? Yeah. 
Um, it's funny. I was with uh, a fellow astronaut a couple of years ago in, in London, Chris Hadfield and, and uh, Brian Cox asked us and he said, yeah, I, you can't really see stars at night. And I was like, Chris, what space station were you on, man? If you turn the lights off and mm. in, in the cupola and you turn the lights off in node three and you let your eyes adjust and you turn the lights off outside, there are these robotic lights that are, you know, if they're in your eyeball, you're not going to see anything. If you let your eyes adjust, there's more stars than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I know all the basic constellations. I could never see a constellation when I was in space because there were so many stars. Um, wow. I could see the, the planets. The planets stand out, but the stars, there's just too many. And the galaxy is this big milky way. You know, it's appropriately named. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I shot a lot of time lapses, so videos of the galaxy. And Tony in the IMAX movie did an amazing job where um, she took the shot. You can see the moon glint on the ocean, and then you just go flying up into the Milky Way. You see these different colored hydrogen clouds. It's a, it's a beautiful shot. Yeah. But yeah, this, the stars are amazing, and, and you go like, wow, there's a lot of stars out there. There's a <laughs> lot of stars out there. <laughs> yeah, and Those are just imagine. the ones you can see. Those are just the ones you can see with your eye. I mean, there's probably, I don't know, how, on Earth, there's like thousands. So maybe from space, there's a million, maybe. Ooh. You know, it's, it's nowhere close to how many there really are. Um, yeah. The, of all those stars, that was just a small percentage of what's actually out there. Mm -hmm. Man, it's just so crazy. I, I just, that experience is crazy. I'm so just, uh, I would love to experience it somehow. Do you think we'll ever get yeah. to like a, like a space tourism type of thing? Well, I think in the near future, I think 2021 will be the first space tourist you know, paying to launch into space. They're just going to be nighttime, go up and come right back down flights. Sure. Um, so unfortunately, I think that's not, it's limited, but it would be so cool. Yeah. It's also going to cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, <laughs> but you know, that that's attainable for okay. an upper middle class person to save up for, you know, five or 10 years. There, there's there's a large number of people on Earth that could save up two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars to get into orbit. They're charging twenty five million or fifty million or more, Ooh. and the, you know, a small fraction of humanity would ever be able to save that up in a lifetime. So that's that's something that's that's definitely farther in the in the future. But I think the suborbital five minute flights um, are going to start happening soon, and they're going to be pretty awesome. I mean, it's only five minutes. So you better enjoy it as much as you can, but it's right, going to yeah. be pretty awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. So would you get to, um, if, for a suborbital, would you get to, uh, experience the weightlessness or is that too? Oh long? yeah. You would. No, you'll float, you'll float for like five minutes. Yeah. Oh, uh, you man. can experience weightlessness on an airplane. This company called zero G That's right. You can buy a ticket. It's a few thousand bucks and you can go and it pulls up. And I did this in NASA. There's a chapter in how to astronaut about, um, uh -huh. the zero G flights. Um, the vomit uh, comet, pull, right? You, the vomit comet. The chapter is called "The Vomit Comet: Your First Taste of Weightlessness," um, which is pretty funny. Man, so you, anybody could just do that. It's like a c commercial thing. Yeah. I could just buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. I'm, wow. I I assume you got to get a physical. They probably have a doctor that'll check you out to make sure probably. you're not going to have a heart attack. But yeah, man, I gotta get on that. That'd be fun. So yeah, what is that? You know, that's, that's a couple thousand bucks. That's doable. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, yeah. So what is, what is it like to be, I, cause I had this realization like a year ago. I, for some reason I, I had watched too many space movies or something and I had figured that we had grav that there was gravity up there in the space station or something, but we don't have artificial gravity, do we? Well, there's, um, there's centrifuges for ex experiments, but not for people. It's not okay. like 2001. Yeah. It, it's only for experiment stuff. Okay. So, yeah. So I don't know, for some reason, I just had it in my head that there was like, that you guys had gravity up there. So what is it like to spend, you know, a few months in zero gravity? Is it, does it lose? Is it, first of all, is it, is it pretty cool at first? Is it fun? Oh yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, I loved it, but everything's harder in gravity except for pull-ups. So in, in weightlessness. <laughs> so, um, your stuff floats away. It's just hard to keep track of stuff. You always have to put tethers or keep it in your pocket or use Velcro. Um, but uh, once you get good at it, it's, the, the, the learning curve is pretty steep for a few weeks. Um, 
it's awesome. I loved it. it and, I, and I felt like I got pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. And so what are the, um, is there any sort of long-term effects? Cause I feel like this is always talked about, like what are the effects of being in, you know, zero gravity for a few months on your mm-hmm. body, you know, physically? Yeah. Well, um, muscles and bones would be the thing you'd think of, right? Cause they're not right. getting used. And so NASA, we learned from the Russians on Mir and, um, we came up with a protocol of exercise. We have two and a half hours of exercise today plus vitamin D. So I did that every day. I was very, very diligent, except for my three spacewalking days and this big emergency day we had, um, I exercised every day. Uh, and then when I got back, I went to the gym every day to do rehab. So I was, I was really diligent about it and over 200 days doing weightlifting and either treadmill or bike every day. Um, I lost 0.0% of my bone density. Wow. So basically the space station has proved that you can live and work in space and be fine and be, and come back in good shape. Now that's bones and muscles, you know, physical strength. Um, cancer is a different deal. Uh, radiation is a, is a big problem. Right. We haven't solved it. We really don't, we measure how much radiation there is, but we don't measure how it affects our bodies at all. We haven't studied that except for a few minor studies. Um, and so that, to me, that's really the big thing. That's where we should be going with our, uh, with our human spaceflight program. Right. Okay. So we've kind of figured out you got to work out a long time, which kind of, I mean, it's hard enough to get people to work out down here on earth. So we'll see about up in space, but, uh, it's good. We figured that out, but yeah, the, it's just too much radiation there. So there's really no, no solution to that yet. So there's a couple solutions to radiation. The most important one is avoid it. So, you know, spend less time in it. So when it comes to Mars, rather than taking a three year round trip, you turn, if you have faster propulsion, electric propulsion, you can get there and back in one year. So I think that's the best thing for us to do when it comes to Mars. Um, And then you can have shielding, um, which is tough in space because lead is really heavy and, you know, we're not going to fly lead. We do fly water and water is actually a really good radiation shield. Oh, so if you design a spaceship with water around the crew, that would help a lot. Um, and, uh, and then beyond that, you know, improve treatment. Cause guys are going to, I got skin cancer after both my space flights. I still have really? to deal with that. Yeah. And so who knows where it came from, but I, it probably came from space. Cause after both missions, I had really bad skin cancer. So, um, it just improved treatments on the ground, you know, to a certain extent. Well, if you get it, we'll treat it and it won't be as bad. Right. Wow. I, I didn't realize it was that, uh, that much of an issue, I guess. Well, I, you know, uh, several of my friends have died from cancer in the astronaut office. Um, oh, man. So it, it's an issue. Yeah. It's not like everybody's dying left and right and some big giant issue, but um, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's everywhere, even for, non-astronauts you know mm-hmm. uh, um so what a, you mentioned uh because you you did a few spacewalks what is that like how does how does that feel to be you know walking in space yeah it's amazing um it's uh i've never felt so on the clock you know like i had to stuff to get done. Really? Um, yeah, because it's dangerous out there. You don't want to waste any time at all. And there's so much work to do. So there's no time for goofing around. You just got to work, work, work. And then 99% of it is you got a face full of metal and equipment and you're working. And then every once in a while, 1% of the time you'd stop. And Mm. it was like, I was hearing from God. Like I was seeing creation, the things that humans weren't meant to see. And then I had to get back to work to plug in the next cable. So it was really profound. Um, uh, it was the juxtaposition of sublime and mundane, I think is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. So what are the, what are the dangers while you're out there? Well, you could get hit by debris. That's the biggest danger. Oh. If you get hit by debris, it's a, uh, um, it could just be a little nick. It could just put a little dent in your spacesuit, or it could go right through you, you know? So that's <laughs> probably the biggest thing. That's pretty or bad. Or if you get a cut. If you get a cut or something like that, you got an air leak, 
Um, if you're, if the fan stops and the cooling stops, you could overheat within minutes. It, you know, those suits get super hot, especially in sunlight. Um, uh, you could have your helmet could fill with water. That happened to a guy named Luca Parmitano a few years ago. He almost died. It was really bad, really, really bad. Uh, so there, there's definitely some, some things that you don't want to have happen while you're outside. How would the, how would the helmet fill with water? There's a water system. The, the water flows through the spacesuit. It makes an ice pack and that ice pack sublimates. So it's like solid water to gas sublimation. And that, cools down the spacesuit um it's like evaporative cooling when you're in phoenix you you spray water on you and you feel cool Mm -hmm. or when you sweat your sweat evaporates and that cools you down so the spacesuit uses the same principle um and there was a leak in that system and then that and then also it uses cool water to go flow through your long underwear there's these plastic tubes of water in your long underwear. And so that system leaked into his helmet and it just floats. And Jeez. that, yeah, that, that's not what you want to have happen. I had on, we were very aware of it on my, on my second spacewalk. Um, my helmet started to fill with water and I could see this big blob. My whole visor was covered and it was squishy. Like I put my head up and it was a squish, squish, squish. And um, I, thought okay this is bad so we had a call it turned out that that was that was more like ice uh, or water on a cold iced tea glass um Mm, so i see then it was yeah so uh that actually did not lead to any big problems but um it did uh cause a lot of concern for sure right yeah so have you had any real real close calls up there real moments of danger the biggest thing for me personally was probably um, uh, so the biggest issue for sure. I wrote about it in View from Above and also How to Astronaut. You know, I talk about this. Um, the uh, the space station has a cooling system. It's for ammonia, and it's a it's just like a radiator fluid in your car. Uh, mm-hmm. runs through these radiators. It takes heat from inside. It puts it out in space. Um, and if the ammonia leaks, it's really bad. They told us if you smell ammonia, don't worry about trying to fix it because you're going to die. So uh, <laughs> anyway, th- this, that, that there's a whole chapter. I don't want to spoil the story, but yeah, that, that alarm went off. It surprised us to say the least. When I saw the alarm, I didn't believe it. I was like, Samantha, that's got to be an air leak, right? And she was like, nope, that's ammonia leak. And so, um, yeah, that was a big deal. We we spent a day thinking the space station was going to die. Uh, it's chapter five in my view from both book. Like I said, I re- in How to Astronaut, I wrote I wrote about it. It was a really big deal. Uh, the Russian prime minister called us, and the Russians don't use ammonia; they use sugar water, so it's not a problem. And they oh, um, sounds great. It, it, it it's not as good. It's it, thermally, it doesn't have the same thermal properties. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't kill you dead, so there's advantages to their system too. So anyway, we we. Um, uh, we went down the Russian segment and he called us up and said, Hey, Americans, you can stay as long as you want. We'll work together. It was a really, really great moment of international cooperation. Like this is how people should work together mm-hmm. as opposed to all the, you know, it's been a rough five, six, seven years between America and Russia. Um, and that was like one rare positive moment. So that was probably one of the most important moments in all my time in space. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So how often, cause how often are you interacting with, well, first of all, how many people are up on the, the space station with you generally? And are you kind of all roommates hanging out right. or what's the deal with that? So, um, the, no, well, <laughs> the, I'm trying to think, The we're not, so we're, there's about six people there. Normally it's three people on a Soyuz and four people on a SpaceX or Boeing. And so it's three six, three, six, three, seven, three, six, you know, depending on if there's two Soyuzes or a Soyuz and a SpaceX or whatever, it's normally three or six or seven people. And, uh, you know, you're just normally working all day long, work, 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 work. And then, Mm -hmm. um, in the evenings, I, as a commander, I made it a really big point to spend time with the Russians on the Russian segment. Cause otherwise you just, you're just separated constantly. Um, so that was my kind of thing to do as commander. Um, 
uh, which was good. And, and we're still good friends to this day. This one more orbit movie I filmed, um, Gennady Padalka flew with us on this. We, we flew around the earth over the North and South pole, set a world record. Um, and Gennady flew with us and he was the Russian with the most time ever in space, 897 days on his five flights. And he was also with me on expedition 43. So we were in space together and then we did this mission on earth together. It was pretty fun. Man. And then what is the, um, what's the process or the, uh, maybe the feeling or whatever, when you get back to earth, what is, is that just depressing? Are you like, now I got to deal with gravity here? Yeah. You know, I was really worried about that because space is so incredible. You know, it's like, yeah. what do you do after you win the world series or after you win an Oscar, what do you do? Disneyland. Um, and I think if you're an astronaut, what do you do after you find space? And so a lot of my crewmates, they just go, they just get back in line and they get back in line. Like at really? Disneyland, they get back in line. Mm-hmm. They just want to do it again. Um, and after my first flight, I wanted to do it again. Two weeks. But after my 200 day mission, I was like, you know what? I was a space shuttle pilot. I was a space station commander. Um, I was, uh, did three spacewalks. I filmed an IMAX movie. I spent seven months in space. Uh, my boss said, well, it's going to be five years before you fly again. So I'm like, I could get in line and wait five years or I go do something else in life. And mm-hmm. I, and I was at the point where I've been here for 16 years. I've been 30 years in the air force. So I've been done nothing but government my whole life. And I was ready to go try the private sector. I wanted to communicate, to share this story. I, re- I wanted to write books and do speaking and Um, you know, kind of my secret dream would be to direct films and, or be in either behind the camera or in front of the camera. And so I said, you know what, I'm in my forties. This is, if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time to do it. So, so I left and, uh, stopped getting a guaranteed paycheck every two weeks. That was a big risk. Um, but it, but it's been, it's gone like it's been really well. It's, it's gone really well, but, um, and then COVID hit and all that stuff came to a screeching halt. So but that's okay. Yeah. Um, you have to be, you have to be able to adapt and maybe that's the lesson that I've learned is, um, you know, nothing lasts forever. And so like Darwin said, it's not the strongest who survive. It's those who are most able to adapt to who survive. Um, and I think that's true. You know, there's some people in some industries that, you know, it, it's not coming back or it, when it does come back, it won't be as good as it was before. And then there's other industries that just started and they're booming. And, yeah. you know, so I think people who are able to go, man, it's been a great ride. Let's move on to the next thing are ones who are going to thrive and ones who just can't get over it. You know, like if you're working in the rust belt and manufacturing and coal and, you know, it's not 1985 anymore yet. You have to move on to the next thing. And if you do, you can make way more money and it's a much more interesting career. But, um, that's, I think that's common throughout human history, being able to adapt and is, is a good skill to have. And 2020 has certainly made that abundantly clear. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, congrats. You have an, uh, you know, an amazing resume you're doing, you know, an incredible, incredible stuff right now, all these new films and books you're doing. Um, it's fun. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Congrats. I'm really, really happy to see all this. Uh, but I got to ask, cause I'm curious if you have, you know, because you have a Lisa, uh, you want to be a director and everything like that. Are you, um, do you have any, a favorite space film or like a, a you know, one that's yeah. the best portrayal of space. I'll tell you, um, I've one of the best films of all time. I don't have one, but I probably have a Mount Rushmore. Uh-huh. And one of the best ones of all time is Apollo 11. It's a documentary Ooh. that came out last year. And I'll, yes. I highly recommend if you're watching this or listening to this podcast and you haven't seen it, watch Apollo 11. Uh, um, it's, there's no narrator. It's all original footage. The director, Todd Douglas Miller, came across all of this kind of never before seen NASA footage. And it is one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. It's so good. It made, I was sweating way more watching that movie than I was during my own launch. Wow. Okay. Um, it, it was really good. I, I, I did a panel with him out in Hollywood last fall. Um, and he, he was incredible. He did an incredible storytelling job with just live footage and and audio you know as is real real world stuff none of it's none of it's scripted at all so that was really good um another the right stuff is obviously i talked about that earlier that's 
timeless. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, Interstellar is a great film. I love Interstellar because okay. uh, it's science fiction stuff. Although the the black hole and relativity is interesting. I got a chapter in How to Astronaut about time travel because I time traveled mm. when I was in space. The relativity affected me during my space flight. Right. Um, but it, it, at its core, Interstellar is a story about a father and a daughter, which I love. Mm hmm. Very cool, man. Well, this is great. I really appreciate you you coming on here, Terry, and being generous with your mm -hmm. time and sharing all this stuff. It's just such a, it's such a fun treat to be able to ask you all these questions. And you just got yeah. such a, a crazy story, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, this is awesome. Thanks for having me on. This is fun. Yeah. Um, and then let's just real quick for people listening, um, anywhere because we have we mentioned all your your movies and your books. Different Should we stuff. send anywhere specific for that to to get all that yeah, stuff? Yeah. So yeah, the biggest thing is probably How to Astronaut, the book I have out. Um, it, we haven't really talked about it. It's 51 short chapters. It's everything about space flight. A lot of stuff you'd expect. Uh, a few chapters you wouldn't expect. Things like, you know, what do you do with a dead body or some other even crazier cool. stuff. Qu questions everybody wants to know. Yeah. Aliens and God and if people had sex in space and stuff like that. Um <laughs> And it's short. It's it's designed to make you laugh and say wow. And it's for anybody. It's not for like space nerds only. It's it's cool. you know men and women, old and young. It's it's a pretty. Uh, it, hopefully, I tried to write it in a down to earth style, and I think all the critics so far have have agreed that it's very accessible. So, how to astronauts is probably my biggest thing. And then my movie, One More Orbit, just came out. Um, it's about this setting a world record flying over the North and South Pole. We did it in honor of Apollo 11. So it's kind of one more orbit. Um, mm. And and it's about the adventure of setting the world record. But it's also, more importantly, it's a story of unity because we had people from 10 different countries on the Gulfstream business jet that we were on. Um, coming together to work on it and Apollo kind of brought the world together. So it's how exploration can bring the world together. There's a, there's a section there about climate change um, uh, and really how to solve it. it. It's a pretty cool organization. I found the organization called the carbon underground. Um, so yeah, that those are the two big things, how to astronaut and one more orbit for me. Okay. For now. So, now. Cool. Sweet. Well, I'll have links to some of that stuff for people to get. And then should we just send them to your website too? Is that kind of a good place yeah. to get stuff? Terryvirch.com has, you know, a couple different books, my view from above. I, I did an, a reproduction of an Apollo 11 flight plan. That's pretty amazing. The company that does all the head of state gifts for the white house did this Apollo 11 reproduction. It's amazing. Wow. Um, they, my books are on there. The movies on there. I did a, I made a short film a few months ago um, that I'm hoping to get turned into a series or, a, or at least a documentary called Cosmic Perspective. It's about space photography and how space photography has changed the world. Um, so anyway, it's a lot of my projects are on there. Yeah. God, this is so fun. I, I love this, Terry. Thank you for being on and sharing all this stuff. Uh, I just am in awe. I want to be like you when I grow up. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I'm still confused. <laughs> Uh, man, well, thanks Sounds again. Um, yeah, appreciate right. you taking the time and uh, have a good one. Thank you. Thanks. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Episode 100 is over. That's good, right? Told you it was good. Thank you so much to Terry for being on and, and you know, sharing all that stuff with us. I had like... I only got to like a quarter of the questions I wanted to ask him. There's so much that I wanted to ask, but uh, just super thankful and, and, you know, happy that I got to talk to a real astronaut. That was fun. Thank you to you, the listener for being here and hope you enjoyed that conversation with Terry. And uh, it's the hundredth episode. Oh boy. So look, I've done this for a hundred episodes it's been great. I'm extremely thankful and, and happy and lucky. Uh, I, I just love doing this and uh, am really thankful to you for listening. I've, I've had a, a few people even reach out and say that they enjoy the show and that's, you know, give me some, some thoughts and ideas. I've had some criticism too, trying to get better at my interviewing. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's getting there. I think I'm a lot better than when I started, but I just can't believe that I've done 100 episodes. And uh, I have like almost 500 reviews on Apple Podcasts, which is very cool. That has definitely helped with getting guests on this show. I can attest to it on this one. I got a, I got a astronaut on episode 100, but uh, I, it's really, really cool. So I appreciate all the people leaving reviews and all the feedback. Um, I've been able to get some really, really crazy guests. Um, like, 
<laughs> all the people that I've had on this. When I look, when I go through and look at the list of all the people that I've interviewed on this show in a hundred episodes, it's really crazy. Um, I mean, I've interviewed Pete Williamson from Electric GT about converting classic cars to electric vehicles. I interviewed a, a modern day lighthouse keeper, Spence Wilson, Star Wars vis- visual effects guy Richard Endland. I mean, Charles Phoenix. I've interviewed Charles Phoenix. Uh, it's just crazy. I've been to the Hugh Hauser exhibit. Love that. That was super fun. The DeLorean Motor Company, Stonehenge. Uh, I mean, it just goes on. It's crazy when I really look back at all the all the episodes that I've done. It really feels really, really cool. And I am extremely thankful and, and happy that I have the opportunity to do all this stuff. I did my Apollo moon landing series for the 50th anniversary. Man, I got to talk to the Apollo 13 Ecom flight controller, Cy Lieber got. That was crazy. That's super cool that I've gotten to do all this stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I, I could just go on and on. I'm just extremely thankful. And you know, this if you've been around for a while, which is a long time, I started this almost two years ago, over two years ago, you know, this started off as like a van camping, van camping, van life show. Like that's what it was. It was focused on that. But then, you know, I decided that I just had more stuff I was interested in, more things I wanted to dive into and people I wanted to interview. So I kind of changed it. I pivoted it, rebranded it from uh, campers and vans getting coffee to curiosityness to what it is today. And I just have had the best time getting to interview all these really cool people. So, um, yeah, it's just a lot. Uh, I, I am really thankful and, uh, and, and just so happy that I get to do it. I appreciate all you people listening, all you guys out there who have, you know, supported me and left reviews and emailed me. If you're a regular listener, please reach out, email me. It's been really, really cool to uh, talk to some people who, who listen to the show regularly and, and get their thoughts. It, it really feels good to, uh, to know that people are listening to this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could just go on and on, but I, I'll, I'll kind of cut it off. So hundred episodes, I'm very, very happy, excited. appreciate all of you. And, uh, I can't wait to to do episode 200 and and talk to you all again. So uh, that's it. Goodbye. I'll see you later.